Okay, um, this session is entitled Wrap Up, which I was asked to do, suggested I, I give a wrap up. Now, I'm not a specialist in this area at all, but nevertheless, I've found it an absolute fascinating day. I haven't attended all of the talks, um, and so I don't know all of the issues that have been raised. So I've actually asked four people onto the stage here to give a few comments. But um, first of all, just um, my own comment is that um, this has been a brilliant day in my mind, starting from um, Dr. Pachauri's absolutely inspirational talk, I would say, at the beginning of the session. I think we're very lucky to, to have him here. He's obviously got an extremely full di diary. Uh, the sort of activities he involves in across the world is just remarkable. As he was talking about, uh, I had the fortune to have both breakfast and lunch with him. And um, so that, that was a fantastic start to, to the day. What came over, though, was a great sympathy for Scotland uh, from him. So I think he, uh, we might benefit, hopefully, from having him here for uh, additional uh, engagement uh, in the future. And I th think I, I must uh, ask, uh, thank Harry for uh, writing the letter of invitation to, to getting him to, to come. So um, this has obviously been a, a heavy at what bias to sustainable development, deliberately, because uh, we were wanting to both demonstrate and uh, stimulate discussion on the areas that we are interested in. But nevertheless, I think the, the coverage, everything from hydro nations and materials, design and planning architecture, infrastructure into HS2s and road transport, logistics and such like, I mean, just it's, it's been a very, very broad coverage of, of sustainable uh, uh, development into social issues, economies, etc. So it has been a split session today for pretty well all of the day, so not all of you will have heard all of the, the, uh, the talks. And so I thought um, that uh, I would ask our four people just to make some comments. I primed them a little bit. Um, they could, they're, they're free to say anything they like, but uh, just as long as it's brief, because we, we have wine outside and we want to get out to the wine fairly quickly. But um, uh, so if they could be brief, but I primed them just to um, say what they thought their highlights uh, of the day were. I hope they won't talk about what they talked about themselves. Uh, they will, what, but basically what they're picked up that they're taking away from the day. Um, we're always interested uh, to explore how we can best engage between universities and industry. We have a knowledge exchange agenda. We've got impact in REF. We've got innovation centres coming along from the Scottish Funding Council. And any comment is always useful in terms of the best practice in terms of that engagement between uh, the two. And if they wish, just a comment about the future. Where is this all going in terms of sustainable development? So I would like to ask Sue Rolf, first of all, to say a few comments. Well, you've, you've heard quite enough from me on, my, on the, uh, my own academic take. But the highlight for me, really, of today, one of the highlights, was sitting at our stall outside. We we're trying to, to tell people about the iCarb process and so on. But was to meet meeting all of you from industry um, who came over from ACOM or um, various organized Scottish Power or a lot of the people who share a common interest. And I think that the tremendous thing about Scotland, um, probably something that helped us in the original enlightenment, and as Patrick Corbett would say, will help us in the carbon enlightenment, is the fact that Scotland is such an enormously joined up place so um, I, I've said enough already, but I, I will just reinforce that point, that um, the connections between um, industry, research, government, and um, of course um, the professions here is absolutely vital to our ability to lead real innovation. And just the last point, I didn't have time when Sam asked, what is our secreting weapon for the future, the next best thing? I would say take a look at, look at our students because um, they are part of the solution and um, we have got a fantastic range of very well trained students who can maybe act as a bridge between research and our industries around us and together we can build that low carbon future. 
Thank you, Sue. On to <coughs> Professor Dorda Rick um, Gor Jorgensen, um, who's, if you didn't hear her talk earlier, Sustainability Manager for Atkins Infrastructure and an honorary professor here at uh, Kenny Watt. I think uh, I had lots of highlights today. I think the fact that the boldness of Harry Watt of inviting um, Dr. Pacheco, <laughs> sorry for the pronunciation, um, and to witness his talk and the work that they're doing in the IPPC. But as somebody, when we work in industry, we have the opportunity to put the question I put to him like, what we're faced with is how do we convince business people to have a stronger buy-in into the climate change agenda? And if we can get a question like that passed on to someone like him, so some, something gets done about it and we get some information back that could be put on the table in business saying, if you don't do anything, it will cost you this much one day. Um, so, and the second highlight for me as well is that um, it's just the awareness about the breadth and the standard of research in the university that I have seen here today. I'm very impressed and blown away by some of the work. And also, I've been in sustainability for, you know, 25 years and seen quite a lot. But the kind of angles and the questions that are being both asked and being answered here are things that I wouldn't have thought about. Um, I saw the logistics work and also Peter Woodward's work and well, very impressive and exciting to know that this is going on. I think if there's going to be stronger links between industry and, um, and academia, I would build on what Sue is saying, that there are here at what people going out there. And it's almost like, you know, if you recorded this information, why not send it out to people who already know here at what and suggested that people actually watch it during their seminars? Because we have lunchtime seminars in industry all the time. And it will really raise the awareness about what's going on. And it is the, the kind of questions you answer. We might not have time to answer them, but it actually opens people's mind. And so it's, it's almost like a marketing uh, bridge that could be built on, on this day, send it out to big business you want to work with, and say, on the CD, you have these presentations, and then have a hair at what person actually do the spiel for you and do some selling. So... Um, if I look to the future, it's almost like what you're achieving with this industry day is actually what we need to achieve, which is we need to, to solve climate change. We need to work more closely together and see aspects from somebody else's point of view, which is what I think this industry is trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Professor Murray Roberts, who is a professor of marine biology. He wasn't a speaker today and perhaps has seen the day from a slightly different perspective. Uh, his interests are in, are in ocean acidification and deep sea coral. So, Murray. Well, thank you, Alan. And so, yes, I have a, a kind of outsider view, I suppose, of, of what has been talked about today. But, I mean, today the themes have been huge. I mean, the challenges that Dr. Pachuri has grappled with through his, through his work with IPC are the biggest challenges that, that humanity has ever faced. So the things that we're talking about are extremely important. And what, what, what do I take away from it? Well, I've learned a lot, for sure. I didn't know about the possibilities of ground storage of heat with aquifer-based systems that we learned about this afternoon. Those are things I'd never come across. Jeremy, your talk was, you know... Uh, 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 an inspiration in, in the use of solar. I think that the strapline I took away from this was the future's bright, the future's solar. I mean, this is, things are changing so quickly. I didn't realize quite what the machinations were underlying some of these issues as different lobby groups influence in sometimes very aggressive ways. We, we don't always know about these things. So I guess to pick up also on, on the point before, the thing I take away from it all really is the great need to raise awareness across the board, to raise awareness of climate change, to raise awareness of the effects this have on marine systems. The acidification of the seas is taking place, yet few people know about this. Um, and to raise awareness of what the solutions are. And once that work is done, and once that hard work keeps going around the world, then those solutions will start to come up through the system. So I think my overall um, take on the day was that there is so much good work going on, but without that awareness raising, it, 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 it clearly can't happen and can't catalyze quickly enough. 
Okay, lastly, we have Jeremy Leggett, who's from Solar Century. Yeah, I too, um, like the other speakers, learned a lot today. I mean, life gets pretty boring when you no longer can learn, and if you can't come to a conference like this and sit and learn interesting things, it's a bad thing. But uh, let me cast my few words as um, a friendly critic, uh, because I think that would be more interesting for people, and I want to um, direct them at the students here more than the... the um, business folk who've stayed on. In my experience, and I used to be a university academic, I was on the faculty at Imperial College for 11 years before I became an environmental campaigner. And I view myself as a businessman still as an environmental campaigner. The universities are a major part of the problem that we find ourselves in, in my experience. And let me explain briefly what I mean with two examples. First, the business schools. The, the way that the financial system crashed the global economy almost catastrophically had an awful lot to do with what they were taught in university business schools. Now, I can only offer that to you as an assertion, but I can assure you it's accurate. Um, the, you know, the financial incumbency is heavily represented in all the top business schools. And so it is in the science and technology universities. Let me take no side swipes at Harriet Watt, because I don't know the university well enough, though I'm honored to be a, um, an honorary doctorate of engineering here, which is a matter of great humor to my, my staff, since they know I still don't know how to wire up a solar panel. Um, but I'll, I'll take a side swipe at Imperial. I went to a student uh, conference on energy there the other day, the faculty members on the platform were, without exception, pretty disappointing, very bland. They spoke like mid-range oil company and uh, engineering company CEOs. There was no critique or examination of the fracking narrative. There was no criticism of nuclear. It was all the safe ground. We need a bit of this, we need a bit of that, we need the other. If you go to Silicon Valley and talk to the people who are financing this stuff, that's not what they're saying. So the universities are behind the game, and you will know why, because you know, where, do the, where do the grants come from? Where, where, where is the money coming from? And you as students have huge power. If you don't know this story, it really is an inspirational one, you should know it. A year or so ago, an economics class walked out of their first year economics um, course at Harvard University to the man and woman and said, we don't want to be taught this neoclassical economic model any longer. It's very clear that this is the model that is in the process of bankrupting the world. Many of them went straight down to Wall Street and joined the protesters there, you know, the uh, Occupy protesters. The faculty at Harvard are having to completely revise their economics teaching that they offer these kids. The new economics is being considered and so forth. So you have big power and you should use it and make your professors listen to you. And the final thought is about resilience, because you know, if gloomy people like me are right, the biggest factor in your young lives will be the collapse of the narrative of the conventional energy industry. So whereas the guys at the business schools have lived through the collapse of the narrative about mortgage-backed securities, um, and how they were going to bring great wealth to the world and everything else. That whole thing has been exposed as a dreadful collective enculturated mistake. The same thing uh, people like me believe, and there are many of us more warning about this than warned about the financial crisis. Energy is going the same way, and uh, we, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and we won't be able to avoid uh, a, a big energy crunch. And so it's resilience. It's all forms of resilience. So my colleague here mentioned the Mac McDonald presentation. Fa I was fascinated by that. You know, I too didn't know very mu uh, much at all about it. You think how that can work with communities. It's just the tip of the iceberg, some of the solar stuff and the energy efficiency stuff. So think outside the box and make sure your profs do as well. OK, thank you. No strong views there then. So. <laughs> Okay, I'll uh, give you an opportunity to ask any questions of this panel. We've got Claire and Kirsty at the back with microphones. Do we have any questions? Yes, we have one here in the middle. Is the microphone coming? Yeah. Uh, 
I read an item just the other day about uh, uh, a chasm that hadn't been explored before on the seabed, releasing enormous energy. Uh, can uh, uh, Murray fill us in on this new and exciting uh, development? I'm not sure I can. A chasm on the seabed that was releasing energy, uh, I didn't follow that particular story. I don't know if anyone else on the panel or in the room, there are a few marine biologists knocking around, have seen that particular story. Was it a... I think it's, it's a new, very deep funnel, far lower than that they, they found before with um, heat energy and life. Uh, you know, significantly lower So than perhaps the it's a hydrothermal trench. system, is it? Yeah, it's it a vent. Is. So yeah. the, okay, yeah. so the... Oh, in terms of generating power from these places, there are depths that are extremely challenging to work, but the technology that the oil industry uses routinely is allowing some of these areas to be looked at. The main development I'm aware of, and in fact uh, we're involved in discussions about this at the moment, is the mining of such areas for metals that we all use every day in our mobile phones. And it's those pressures that are making it now feasible for uh, deep sea mining interests to look at seafloor massive sulphide deposits. And they're laid down by the same processes that when they're active uh, are venting hot fluids from the seafloor. But I suppose the, the alternatives to consider, which I don't think was on the agenda so much today, the role of exploiting uh, to a greater extent, geothermal sources of energy in places further away from uh, volcanic activity. These are things that I, I'm not a geoengineer. I, I really would be going onto very thin ice to talk much more about. But there clearly are opportunities in geothermal energy uh, exploitation. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the panel? Um, active and very effective hot rocks project in Cornwall using the granites where they actually were on the verge of, of developing a, or building, the, uh, finally building a power station powered by hot rocks um, and then suddenly just as it was all systems go the funding was just pulled again so that technology went over the cliff unfortunately the exigencies of our funding model seem to not favour uh, have not favoured in the past these things. So. Okay, if there's no more questions, I think we should thank the panel again. Thank you very much.